Okay, welcome to the lecture for research methods. Uh, this lecture is meant to help you in writing the introduction to your research proposal uh, and also uh, should serve to help you writing the introduction section to uh, any empirical study uh, that you might propose or actually conduct. So first we'll talk about some, some key points. Uh, one, the, the purpose of the uh, introduction. Well, basically it just sets the stage for the, the rest of your paper. Um, that's why it's <laughs> the introduction. Um, but in the introduction, there's a couple things you want to be sure uh, and do. You want to identify some problem, and it could be you know a real-world problem. You know, if you're doing kind of applied science stuff, or it could be more um, uh, basic science stuff. We're just looking at you know um, exactly how something happens, or examining some theoretical um, uh, phenomenon. Uh, regardless, you need to identify some problem that you know needs to be looked at and kind of uh, justify that it's important to look at for some reason, not just you uh, having fun, uh, you know, looking at, okay, well, do people like, uh, for an American flag, would they rather have the white stripes on top or the red stripes on top? Probably not really a meaningful study. You'd be hard for us to identify the importance of that problem. So you choose a problem that has some importance and then um, present the argument for that importance somewhere in the introduction. Uh, you also are going to want to provide uh, some background information uh, uh, by doing a, a literature review about what we know about this problem so far, uh, including kind of theoretical and empirical knowledge. Uh, and then your introduction should serve as a, a segue into the method. So as soon as somebody gets done reading your intro, they say, okay, well, I wonder how they do that. Right? So it's, it's an interesting problem giving background and then kind of telling all the stuff about um, that there's something that we don't know yet, uh, that you're going to find it, um, the basics of how you'll find the answer, and a rationale for why your answer, which you think is going to be found, uh, will be found. Okay. Um, the, the basic, uh, if you think about kind of a conceptual shape to your introduction, would be uh, a funnel shape. You want to start um, broadly, because you know, your, study, your study is only going to be looking at um, one facet of some larger issue or problem. Before you can get to your specific question, you've got to give the reader a context uh, for your question. So you, you start broadly, and your intro typically advances from some broad aspects of a question, and then you logically lead the reader to your topic. Um, you know, and there are probably other avenues they could have gone down from that broad beginning, but you're kind of providing a compelling rationale along the way for following your lead. So you start broadly, and then end uh, with a more narrow focus on your study. Um, you know, so um, starting with you, know, uh, partner violence I is an important issue, and here's why. Start with that. But then your research study isn't what is partner violence. It might be um, what role does alcohol use play um, in the uh, initiation of partner violence. Right? So you don't start with that. You start with the broader question, and you work your way down to a more narrow question. And it would like to be even more more narrow than that. Um, citations. Most of the introduction will be literature review, and that means that the majority of the sentences uh, will have, that you have in your introduction will have a citation after them. You know, if, you, if you look at your introduction and you see a sentence that doesn't have a citation, you need to check and make sure that it doesn't need one. Make sure that uh, it's clear to the reader that that, that sentence that doesn't have a citation is either your opinion or you know, something you did or will do, you know, we're kind of talking about your hypotheses or your proposed method, don't need to factor that obviously, uh, or if it's something that's common knowledge. Otherwise, they should probably have a citation somewhere in there. Uh, another just kind of uh, key thing to keep, keep in mind uh, about combining sources, you know, if you find uh, when doing your literature, literature review that more than one study found the same thing, which is typical because, you know, maybe somebody found uh, uh, some effect uh, on, on one variable of another variable looking at college students and somebody else replicated that study uh, looking at um, retired individuals. You know, so you have the same basic finding just done in slightly different ways. It's usually not uh, necessary to go into details of every single one of those studies unless there's some important methodological point to make. And so it's uh, often better to combine all those things into you know, one sentence and then you cite all those sources for that one sentence at once. So, um, uh, a frequent finding in research is that um, 
males of a species uh, are more aggressive than females. And you could cite, you know, uh, a dozen studies after that that include both human and non-human species probably. Uh, they go from, you know, domestic violence stuff to childhood aggression, you know, all these different things, because all those things support that one kind of broader sentence. Um, but you only go into the detailed stuff if you're making some point about it. You don't need to give a, a book report about every study ever done. You're just kind of hitting what are the key facets uh, of knowledge that the different studies uh, provided relevant to your topic. Okay, so now uh, getting on toward an outline. You know, I know the, the outline assignment uh, was challenging. Uh, you know, and there was, there was significant variability among students regarding how closely the product generated fits what you know, I was looking for. Uh, you know, but if, you know, if it's clear that you made an honest effort at completing the assign assignment appropriately, you, you know, you're going to get full credit because really for this assignment, I'm more interested in uh, having you try to think through this than in what you ended up with. Uh, that being said, there, there were some pretty good general outlines generated from this project, uh, and you know, I looked at those uh, before reworking uh, this lecture. And so now I'm going to kind of share with you my thoughts on what should go into the introduction and the typical order that things would, would appear. Uh, pulling from some of the things uh, you all wrote and then my own uh, experiences. Okay, so starting off, the hook, right? So uh, the very first paragraph, the very often the very first sentence uh, in the introduction is going to be something that uh, serves to grab the reader's attention uh, and establish the need for or importance of research on this topic. When I say this topic, I'm talking about in the general area. So again, if I want to look at um, you know, alcohol use and domestic violence, it's not. I don't start off saying, okay, we need to look at alcohol use and domestic violence. I start off, I start off with the importance of looking at domestic violence. And there, there's several ways um, to do that, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but so again, and you don't have to do it all in one sentence, but you know, some really good writers are able to do this uh, in one sentence, kind of get your attention and establish the importance of a problem. But generally, in that first paragraph, that's uh, that's going to be your main goal, um, starting off. Okay, so like I said, there there are multiple ways to do this to, to get your hook, uh, and, and you might just use one of these. You might use combinations of these, um, but these are just some things that you may consider when when developing your introduction. Uh, one would be addressing uh, some real world problem, so domestic violence drug abuse, um, uh, crime rates, whatever. And whoops, when you do that, typically um, the things you, you're going to talk about are either the prevalence, you're going to usually cite some statistic like uh, half of all children uh, in a recent survey report, they don't listen to their parents. Right? You come up with some stat that identifies there's some growing problem or some important problem. Or you're going to cite some stats or some research talking about the consequences of a problem. So and you, and these often occur in tandem. So it might be that you know domestic violence is on the rise, and um, you know of victims of, of domestic violence are at greater risk of death due to you know murder. Um, you know, if you're talking about drug abuse, drug abuse is on the rise, and it leads to it can lead to kidney failure, liver failure, um, incarceration, yada yada. So you can talk about all the con consequences of the problem to help establish the importance. So that's kind of a, a thing you'll see a lot when you do kind of any kind of applied research, something you may want to consider. Another thing I think is, is uh, harder to do, but maybe even better in terms of the advancement of science, is to talk about some established theory. So some theory that relates to your uh, your your question, and it could be uh, it could be different couple things. Could be that you're going to argue then that the theory is inadequate and doesn't correctly uh, account for some some phenomenon that you're interested in looking at or some population uh, that you're interested in looking at. Um, it may be that there's more than one theory that uh, come up with kind of conflicting or different explanations about what is happening or what will happen in some setting uh, that you're going to look at, uh, and you can open with that. Uh, it may also be that. Um, you know, there's some, some theory and you're not looking to disprove it, but you're looking to support it and maybe with a, a new extension or application of the theory. So people have found this to be true, but no one's looked at it with this population or in this way um, under these circumstances. Um, so all those things are good hooks. 
And the, the last one I want to talk about in terms of uh, grabbing attention and establishing importance would be just talking about some new phenomenon. Uh, so it could be uh, things that are happening in society now where we may not even have um, stats at hand, but people kind of know stuff is going on. So we're talking about you know, the increased use of so social media among adolescents. You know, you could open with that if you want to talk about something about uh, you know, cyberbullying. Uh, you could open with, uh, for that you could open with the thing about increased social media, or you could open with the prevalence and impact of bullying, uh, you could open with uh, theory of aggression, so there's lots of different ways to open, but you need to come up with some way to grab your attention and establish that, okay, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a general idea of the ballpark that we're gonna be playing in today, and why it's important to, to be in that ballpark. Okay, so after you do that, after you hook up, the next thing is to define and clarify uh, the concepts you're going to be talking about. And you may not always have to do this, but it's pretty common that whenever you're talking about anything, you want to clarify exactly what uh, what kind of variables you're talking about. But not variables at that concept level, not the kind of how I'm going to measure it level yet. Um, and this is because sometimes there are divergent understandings of a concept, like bullying. People may think, uh, yes, well, what, what is bullying? To different people, different things may or may not be bullying. You know, um, if uh, you know, uh, some uh, one child asks another child to play, and the child says no, some people might say that the person who said no uh, just uh, bullied the other child. Other people would, would disagree. So you want to clarify if there are kind of divergent understandings out there, uh, which one, which understanding you're going to be using, which one you're going to uh, ascribe to uh, in your study, and that you're going to so. There's lots of different ways of changing this. When I look at it, I'm talking about this, this aspect of this concept or these concepts. Um, frequently in, in our field, uh, when you're doing research on mental disorders, uh, you want to clarify for the reader what you're talking about because, um, you know, are you talking about the disorder as understood through the DSM-4 TR, um, through DSM-4, DSM-3, uh, through some other um, nomenclature that you know, uh, is only used in, in certain areas? Um, is it uh, kind of a, a research understanding of disorder? Which the research understandings of disorders are frequently different than the diagnostic categorical understandings of disorders. So you may want to discuss using symptoms or not, uh, features of a disorder. So when you talk about you know PTSD, what are you talking about uh, exactly? <coughs> Excuse me. So, and when you do this, defining clarifying concepts, kind of going back a step, kind of showing these things overlap, this may be your hook, especially if um, the concept that you're trying to clarify is some new concept. I'm talking about a new, pho new phenomenon may be your hook. So, you say, okay, recently there's been an uh, increased interest in um, addictions to the Internet. Right? But there's disagreement about whether or not that uh, it exists, and if so, what constitutes that addiction? So that could be uh, your opening, you know, defining and clarifying that, that concept. Okay, so once we've kind of got their attention, we've clarified what we're going to talk about. Now it's time to, to provide some uh, some background, right, to establish the context for the current study. Uh, and this can occur sometimes in a paragraph. Sometimes it can be multiple paragraphs. Just depends on, on your particular study and how much research is out there, and kind of how um, uniform or um, heterogeneous the, the literature is on your topic. Okay, so what you're going to be looking to do here is provide the reader with kind of um, our current understanding of the key issues related to your problem. Uh, if there are any discrepancies in the literature, you want to identify those. You know, so if people disagree about um, some process, some explanation, uh, how things work. You want to identify that uh, if they're relevant. And again, you don't have to cover every single disagreement among researchers because there are probably lots of them. But kind of the key ones that come up over and over again uh, that seem to be important, address those. Um, really important, uh, if at all possible, to identify uh, relevant theories. Um, because the only way that, that science really advances is if we um, after developing theories, test them empirically. You know, if everybody just keeps coming up with 
studies that aren't related to um, any broader um, understanding, which that's what the theory is, right? It's a broader understanding of, of related concepts. We're not going to move forward because there's going to be all these divergent studies out there that nobody knows how to put together. But if you put your study together um, based on a theory, then you can uh, support a theory or not support a theory, and then and the research can can move forward. Okay. Then the the kind of really key part here um, that uh, you have to have. So some other things. It may or may not be present. This you have to have if you're going to write a research paper. In your introduction, you need to identify some gap in the literature. So I've talked about what we know, but as you're doing that, there should be some piece that, okay, well, I wonder, well, we don't know this, and you're going to point that out. So if the, if the reader hasn't picked up on it yet, you're going to make it clear that, however, nobody's looked at this aspect. Right? And it could be a couple things. It could be there's some population that hasn't been examined with, so some phenomenon. Uh, that they have observed, but okay, well is that true for um, immigrants from uh, mainland China? Right? Nobody's looked at that yet, and maybe there's an important reason to look at that population. Uh, similarly, maybe there's some variable that hasn't been examined. So people have said that A causes B, but nobody's looked to see whether or not that relationship is moderated or mediated by some other variable C. Um, so you identify that, or it could be that, you know, in your opinion, when reviewing the research, something's wrong with that previous research. You know, maybe uh, you think they uh, have a misunderstanding of the variables, that they weren't defining the variables uh, appropriately, or that maybe the meaning of those variables uh, have changed. And in the clinical literature, this is a bit of a problem with things like uh, you know, borderline personality disorder. You know, the com concept of being borderline, what we think of it now, is very different from when it first started. So we have to kind of uh, pay attention to that and make sure that uh, current literature using certain uh, words or phrases reflects uh, current understanding. Um, uh, similarly, uh, maybe you think that the, the methodology used in the previous lecture is inadequate. Maybe people have only looked at a particular question with really small sample sizes uh, and with limited power and they failed to find things, but you think, well, you know, they were right with what they were looking for, now I'm going to look for it with a bigger sample, and they just didn't have enough power to find what they were looking for. Um, or, you know, they only did um, survey studies, and really you need to do something experimental to see if there's a true cause and effect relationship here. So uh, that's another thing that you could uh, possibly be something for you to contribute to the literature, which is all what that gap is about. You want to identify the gap, because then you're going to address it. This is kind of the big segue into your study. You know, your study is designed to fill that gap. Okay, so now we come uh, to kind of the, the last few sections of the outline. So, after we've provided kind of a context for our study, and we've set up, okay, here's something that hasn't been looked at, um, now I'm going to move into a review of literature to support uh, my hypothesis. You know, typically this section will open with some, some traditional sentence like, in the present study, blah, blah, or the purpose of the present study, blah, blah, blah. Um, some people prefer to use headings to identify transition uh, from background to current study. So it'll be, you know, a heading with uh, something related to your topic, uh, current knowledge of domestic violence, and then another heading that's the present study, which is a little amateurish. Uh, I prefer the, the, the first one. Um, so uh, we've set up this background, we've identified some problem, now we're going to say, okay, here's the problem that we're going to look at, and now we need to kind of do two things. We need to identify what we expect to happen, and then justify that. Now writers differ in how they want to do this. Uh, some writers prefer to have their, their hypotheses kind of earlier in the paper. So here's what we expect to happen, and then here's why we think it's meant. Here's the rationale. Others prefer to build a rationale that leads up to the hypotheses, and then you state the hypotheses after you've established the rationale. Um, I think the latter, where you kind of do the rationale leading to the hypotheses, uh, uh, is better. Uh, it, just, it looks smoother. Um, it feels less like, uh, like you're trying to sell people on something. It's more like, okay, I see this, I see this. Oh, okay, it makes sense that you would think this. Uh, but that's just a matter of kind of personal taste and style. Either way, you need to make sure you do both those things in terms of um, introducing your hypotheses at some point and providing a rationale. Which one comes first, uh, it's up to you. 
but we'll see in a little bit. Just make sure you you always have hypotheses uh, at the end, whether or not you provided them early on, earlier on, or not. Okay, so we've established concept, the context, and now it's about providing justification for w what we think is going to happen. So even if you don't identify the hypotheses at this point, you need to know what you expect to happen. So you kind of know the endpoint, and you're building to that. Uh, when you do that, a couple things. Uh, you're probably going to want to rely on uh, diverse sources. So when you're doing your lit review, uh, you're finding literature on probably just one kind of topic, right? If you're doing something on um, um, mentoring aggressive kids, and you're looking at just the mentor literature. When it comes to justifying your hypotheses, you may have to go beyond that literature because in that literature, they've already found stuff. So now, like if you're looking at, okay, well, nobody's looked at this other variable, so now you're going to maybe go to another literature. So in the mentor literature, there is no, maybe no studies done on um, temperament of mentors. So now you're going to pull from the, the, this other body of literature on temperament not temperament of mentors, but just temperament of people, maybe temperament of people in helping professions, right? Some kind of related field. And you're going to pull that in make, and connect it to the existing body of literature on your topic. Okay. And that's where you'll typically find uh, places to build your hypotheses rather than just on your kind of um, the original um, the original topic, that research literature. Usually that's pretty well mined and people have found everything there and reported it. If you want something new, what's your study something new, you're going to have to pull in from kind of outside sources. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's important here, uh, if at all possible, to, for your hypotheses to be related to uh, theory, so to be testing a theory, either the theory that you hope to support or a theory that you hope to uh, find isn't correct in a certain instance. Because theory testing is what advances science. Uh, so again, if all possible, try to find some theory and, and it doesn't have to be just in your field. You can pull from uh, kind of marketing research or social psychology. Um, sometimes from computer science, we'll pull things in uh, from kind of these other fields uh, to test those theories uh, and see if uh, we can advance uh, our understanding of how people are uh, and our kind of basic scientific understanding. Um, okay, so in, in this part right here, I know it seems small in the outline. But this should be the bulk of your, your introduction. It should be kind of the justification for your hypotheses. It should be really well developed, very logical, um, and the reader should be going, oh yeah, that really makes sense. Now we finally get to uh, the ending. And again, some other things uh, may go in different orders, but the ending is pretty much always going to have uh, these components. Uh, restatement of the focused research problem. And you may have stated the problem earlier. You probably will have, you know, in that transition from context to your rationale or your hypotheses, but now you want to make sure, in kind of in a very focused way, you know, the study will look at blah, blah, blah. <coughs> and then you're going to say how you're going to look at it, so a kind of a summary of your design or method, and you don't have to go into detail because you have a method section for all the detail, but you generally want to give the reader idea of, you know, how methodologically are you going to answer that question? You know, is it going to be uh, interviews? Is it going to be an analog study? Uh, is it going to be uh, a double-blind uh, experiment? So how are you going to answer the question? And then, again, if you haven't said it already, make sure at the end, the very last thing in your introduction will be your hypothesis. So your expected outcomes. And again, good writing, you'll be able to relate this to what you wrote previously. You had a rationale up there, and so here you would say, so consistent with blah, blah, blah some theory, or so-and-so study, or you know, whatever you discuss in the rationale, it is expected that blah, 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 you have your, your expected outcome. Um, okay, so there's your general uh, outline. So now let's talk about uh, a few last things. <laughs> Spend all time talking about the outline, but the outline is only a guide. It's not a checklist. Uh, sometimes the pieces of this outline will overlap with one another, which we've already seen. Uh, they may occur in slightly different order for different projects. Depending a lot of times, depending on how you start, depending on the hook. But again, remember, you want to funnel it down, go from broad uh, to narrow, and you should always end with a statement of the problem, uh, some basics about the method, and your hypotheses. And somewhere in there, talk about the importance of the problem, basic context, and the rationale for your hypotheses. Uh, 
one of the keys to a, a good introduction is a logical progression of ideas. You know, the reader should be following along as they're reading, thinking, yes, of course, that is an important question. I can't believe no one's noticed this aspect of the question hasn't been addressed yet. Oh, I think the author is dead on uh, with what she expects to find. Hmm, well, that looks like a good way to answer the question. I can't wait to find out what she discovers. Okay, that may be a bit dramatic, but you get my point. Uh, you're taking the reader along, and they should be interested in following along and not confused about why you're talking about certain things or why you move from one idea uh, to the next. Uh, again, and to help you with that, I suggest you start and finish uh, with an outline. Uh, I can't say enough about the importance of, of structure when trying to write an introduction. You, know, you start with an outline, and you build on it, and then after you've written a draft, you know, don't pull your outline back. But just look at your draft and see if you can create an outline from what you wrote. Uh, you know, you might find that you've changed the structure. You, you might have added key ideas. You may go like, okay, that makes sense. It's good to add that. Uh, or more importantly, you might find that you're missing some key linkages between ideas, or you may be missing certain ideas uh, with pieces that you didn't think about uh, before, and that you can't see, you know, the forest for the trees looking at a whole document, but if you try to turn it back into an outline, you may see where some, some, uh, some trees may be missing. Okay, the, uh, the last thing, multiple drafts, don't expect to get it right the first time. Uh, you know, whenever I write, I frequently find that I need to write a draft, throw it away, and then start again from scratch just to get my ideas together. Because, you know, writing, the writing process for me helps me think about it, and I don't, I don't think about all the connections among ideas until I try to write them and force myself um, to write. Hopefully you won't need to follow that process. We have to kind of throw it away and start over. But uh, do expect to write four or more drafts of the intro uh, to get it uh, to where you want it, um, assuming you want it in a, and to, to turn out a good product. You know, because sometimes you just can't see the hole in your logic until it's down on paper. So it takes that process of writing, reading, and revising multiple times um, to, to get a good product done. Okay, so that's about it. Good luck uh, with your writing.